Here is the latest Higher Summits forecast brought to you by our friends at the Mount Washington Observatory. Weather above treeline in the White Mountains is often wildly different than at our trailheads. Before you hike, check the Higher Summits forecast at mountwashington.org. Weather observers working at the nonprofit Mount Washington Observatory write this elevation-based forecast every morning and afternoon. Search and rescue teams, avalanche experts, and backcountry guides all rely on the Higher Summits forecast to anticipate weather conditions above treeline. You should too. Go to mountwashington.org or text FORECAST to 603-356-2137. All right, here is the forecast for May 5th through the weekend. The observatory in the discussion makes note that uh, spring is in effect in the valleys, but up above it's still wintry. So they have uh, 23 inches of snow on the summit of Mount Washington, and a foot of which fell the last 48 hours. And now below treeline, you have all this massive rainfall that's come in. So you have a combination of snow melt. Uh, resulting in waterlogged trails, high water levels across streams and rivers. So just be cautious while you're out there hiking. And uh, also watch out for the uh, transitions, you know, between the wet trails and ice. You know, make sure you have your spikes and you're ready to go. So for Friday, mostly in the clouds with a chance of snow showers, additional snow accumulations of a trace to an inch with a high in the mid-20s. Winds about 20 to 35 miles an hour. Uh, northeast shifting north. And wind chill rising to 5 to 15 above. Friday night, mostly in the clouds, trending towards clearing under partly cloudy skies. Low in the upper 20s, winds north at 20 to 35 miles an hour, increasing to 30 to 45 miles an hour. Now, wind chill 5 to 15 above. Saturday, in the clear under mostly sunny skies, mid 30s. Winds north at 30 to 45 miles an hour, a little gusty, but it's definitely trying to warm up here, which is nice. And the wind chill rising to 15 to 25 above. Um, let's see. Moving on. Fire starters. Cotton balls smothered in petroleum jelly. And a stove for higher altitudes. Those are good good tips. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll hear is instead of cotton balls, um, if you have a dryer in your house and you take the dryer lint, um, mm-hmm. you can save that dryer lint and just mix it up with Vaseline. And that, that also is a really good fire starter. Oh, sure. I've got plenty of that. Yep. Got some in my belly button too. Oh, oh disgusting. I need it. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. <laughs> If I'm really in a pinch. Oh, stop. <laughs> Next topic. from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire. Welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. Episode 104. Hello there. Hey now. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a sec. I have this like, um, it's like this thing that goes click, 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 click to keep me on time in my recording. Oh, me- a metronome. Yeah, what is that? You should be able to shut it off. It's for music. Like, you know, if you're recording to beats and stuff like that, yeah. you should be able to shut it off, right? I do. Yeah, normally I shut it off, but I had my window like small. Oh. So it just... <laughs> 
like I couldn't find the icon to shut it off. But, um, <laughs> It'd be good to keep me on, keep, you know, keep me honest here. But uh, how's everything going? Set the pace. Doing good. Yeah, yeah, just hanging out. Yeah. So as we're recording this, you will have read the Mount Washington Higher Summits forecast. We're close enough where, you know, I'm getting a little bit of a preview here. But the way I'm reading mm-hmm. it is like more kind of snow, crappy weather, a little bit of an opening on Friday evening, but getting windier. Is that what I'm hearing? I haven't looked yet. I usually wait till after five because the latest um, forecast gets posted around four ish, five ish. Okay. So I haven't looked, but from what I hear, it's a a window of uh, better weather uh, Saturday and Sunday, which will let them get up there and take a better look and start fixing the road. Oh, it's been miserable. Miserable. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, but we'll talk about the road in a minute, but we wanted to just start the show off um, to just wish everyone, or, or to say, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> may the 4th be with you. Yes. Ah, yeah. yes. And then, to all the Star Wars fans out there. Yes, and then Cinco de Mayo is tomorrow, so that'll be when the show gets released. And then my daughter, my oldest daughter, Caroline, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, turns 21, so I'm sure she'll wow. be getting... She'll be partying at a bar somewhere. Busy week. I can't believe I'm yeah. old enough to have a daughter that's 21. It just doesn't, doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, it's freaky. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. You want me to do the show opening? Yeah, let's get into it. Okay. Let's get rolling. All right. So welcome to episode 104 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week we are joined by Carly Bascom from the New England Healing Sports Association, also known as NESA. So Carly's going to join us in a segment to talk about adaptive sports and how listeners can support the organization. Uh, in addition to this segment, we'll have some updates on flooding in the White Mountains and some advice on how to monitor river flows as part of your weather assessment while planning hikes. This also prompted me to do a little bit of research and dive into some White Mountain history. So I'm going to explain how uh, river flow and gauge measurement was one of the catalysts for the actual creation of the White Mountains themselves. Um, you have to bear with me. It's a, it's a long story, but we'll get into that. Um, all this plus Stomp's going to provide his lesson plans on all things 10 Essentials. Um, and then we've got some other news and tidbits. We have a hiker spotted in their underwear in Connecticut. We've got no. hikers finding buried treasure. We've got hikers getting impaled and needing rescues. We've got more mountain <laughs> lion attacks. So there's a lot to discuss this week. I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. Let's get started here. All right, Stomp. So we already did May the 4th be with you. You've got a note here that says <laughs> happy 200,000. So what do we get? 200,000 yeah. downloads now? I think we'll hit it this weekend. We're at about 198 and some, you know, some spare change. So we'll hit it after this release for sure. Okay. Happy, right. happy 200K. Yeah. Can you believe it? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, people listen, I guess. I don't know. They, they, it seems like, I, you know, one thing I would tell the listeners, like if you could throw us like um, some of those Apple um, reviews, that would be great. And then I think if you could follow Stomp on Instagram on Slasher, at, what's it, at Slasher Podcast? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we can, S-L-A-S-R. Yeah. So we can continue to grow Stomp's media empire. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I can't tell who's talking to who, by the way, in the direct messages. It's so funny. Well, I got all excited. Sometimes I, I almost never jump in, but I did jump in because somebody was talking about like the hike out to Owl's Head via the Lincoln slide. So I was like jumping in the other night and I was like, I was almost going to text you and be like, stop, I'm, I'm replying. But the, the way to think about it is if you're not answering somebody, then I'm answering yeah. somebody. Oh, uh, that's wicked funny. Yeah. He totally usurped a combo. <laughs> I was but like, I, all right, whatever. <laughs> like 95% of the time that people message Instagram, like stomps answering it. Um, but every <laughs> once in a while I'll hop in. And then if you message Facebook, chances are like, I'll get back to you like a week and a half later. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's looking funny. I'm so horrible with that. But anyway, so mm. um, you've also got another note here, Stomp. You want to talk about trail names again? Like I don't have a trail name and that's sort of like my thing is not having a trail name, but you have one. You're Did I put that in there? Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah, trail names are funny. Um, my current one at the moment is 
I think the one that stuck is Jimmy Chaga's one that he gave me, which is um, Costco because oh, yeah. of my big giant pack and I can stick pretty much Costco inside there. Uh, Mrs. Stone calls me Coba. And those are two official ones. They have to be given to you. And uh, I was just curious what yours was. If, if you had like decided on one or received one. I feel like Jimmy Chaga is in charge of like giving everyone trail names. Didn't he give me one <laughs> something to do with like Excel spreadsheets or something? I don't know. I remember I want to say like micro spike might've been one. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. I can't remember, but you no, know, I don't have a trail name. I don't want a trail. I, if I eventually do like the Appalachian trail, then I would do a trail name, but I don't, I don't know what it would be. Yeah. I guess you have to then. Yeah. Yeah. We'll it's gotta be fly under the radar anonymously. Yeah. I am working on getting somebody that's out on trail right now um, on the show. So um, okay. our friend John had reached out. He's got, he knows somebody who um, is out on trail. She is, I think about 300 miles in. So I was like, connect me with her and I'll, um, I probably kind of want to wait till she gets to Virginia so that she can give a little bit more perspective. But um, mm-hmm. because I think the Virginia is where sort of like, you get past that 600, 700 mile mark and that's where you kind of know like, okay, I'm going to go the whole way or not. Yeah. That's funny. I used to pick up a bunch of uh, AT hikers on Lost Pond, you know, Kangamangas um, area, not Lost Pond, Lost River. Mm -hmm. Um, And they would never tell me their real names. They would be like just solid. No, my my name is whatever, like Bark or whatever. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's funny. I would try to break them. You pick them up like it's got to be by like Beaver Brook, right? When they come off of Musalaki and uh, yeah, no yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So anyway, how did they smell when you picked them up? Oh, terrible! <laughs> I mean, I, I would always put the pack in the back of the truck, and they yeah. jump in, and when they would get out, I'd just like have to like scope around the truck, make sure everything was fine, and there were no ticks and. <laughs> 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 oh. No surprises. I don't know. Well, I wa- I've been watching like some YouTube videos, um, and I think or, I don't know if it's true. Like once you get up into the New England area, but I do know like Georgia, North Carolina, and then like um, into the Smokies. Like it's pretty. It's not unreasonable to like basically do a hostel stay like every other night or something like that. So you can, you can do two days on trail, get off trail, get a hostel. A lot of people will actually like, they'll, they'll stay at a hostel. Then, um, or they'll get picked up at a hostel, get dropped back off before the hostel, hike to the hostel, spend another night there, hike away from the hostel, get picked back up by the hostel. They can do like three nights at the hostel while you're mm-hmm. hiking the trail and just get picked up every night. So people do do that. So you can, you can do the AT a little bougie if you want. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. That's probably how I would have to do it. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I would, I wouldn't complain either. So that's why right. I, I won't do the AT until I have like plenty of money to cover hostel and hotel stays. So, <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure like there's purist hikers that are like, you can't get off trail until it's five days, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, Stomp. So forest roads are starting to open up. So you had posted, there's a couple of open roads. Which which ones are open right now? Well, there are three that are listed as um, open forest roads, and it's Dugway, which is Passacona Way Road. Okay. Mount Clinton Road, which is a, that's a big access point for a lot of the Southern, southern presidentials. Yeah. And then Pond of Safety, which is, um, it's closer to the Wombeck area. Um, you actually would snowmobile up there. Okay. Um, there are a couple others that, which I'm questioning, like Sandwich Notch Road is open, but I think it's only open from the Squam side because I was just up there today jogging around and the 49 side was closed. So take this stuff with a grain of salt, but this is trailsnh.com reports forest road uh, status. So it's a really good uh, resource for these things. Okay. Yeah. So Mount yeah. Clinton will be good because that gets you into Edmonds path trailhead, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Eisenhower, um, and everything else. I'm not, e- I'm not even sure if, um, uh, what is the other road that goes up to Caps Ridge there? Um, Jefferson notch road. Yeah. That can't, be I think that yet. probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then Dugway, Pass Conway, that's basically like what happens with Pass Conway is they shut, they shut the gate right before the Albany bridge, which is off of the kink. 
they must have opened they must open that up and i don't know what the way that the lower falls is running it's probably kind of cool to go up there and check it out we'll, we'll talk about that i think in a, in a minute but anyway that's a good sign that they're mm. starting to open up yeah definitely very good and then uh, did you say you had an update on that missing hiker in japan stop there's an update today saying that they received report that there were three trail runners that were spotted on a post office camera near the bottom of this trail that she apparently was supposed to go on and um, no sign of her, unfortunately, but they're looking for these three people that may be uh, witnesses or may have seen her. Uh, But unfortunately no sign of this woman that went hiking in Japan and uh, is still missing. So this GoFundMe is uh, at 178,000 and apparently the family still needs a lot of help just for, financially just to pull this off to try to keep on looking for her so that's all we have on that we'll keep posting that in the show notes and keep our fingers crossed for a miracle mm-hmm. there yeah. um all right stomp then the rest of this we're going to talk probably about 20 30 minutes here about like sure. um this is going to be a very wet conversation so we're going to talk about like all of the <laughs> sort of washouts that have been going on river le- levels how to how to read uh, river gauges and all this fun stuff. So let's start with yeah. the big one here. So the Mount Washington Auto Road, um, they posted pictures across social media like two days ago as they started popping up. It looks like there's a pretty significant washout. My understanding is that this is around, I originally was like, oh, that mu- it must be the newly paved section, which I think is between mile four and mile five that does like the hairpin turn, but it's not the case. It's mile six, which is up by the Wamsetta trail uh trail junction and then it's right yeah. before that that section where you know how you like you do like it's almost like a, a 90 degree turn and it's that steepest section of the of the road at mile six yep yeah you i know, know it well yeah yeah so it's like <laughs> it looks over the great gulf and and sure. everything so um it looks like it was in that area there and last i read they said that they were going to be working on it they plan to open at the same time that they normally do. So we'll see, but it looks like they're going to mm-hmm. have to get a lot of equipment up there. And the problem is, Whew. is, is it's still snowing and it's crappy exactly. weather. So I don't know. I think all things considered, if the weather stays nice, they'll be able to fix it. But if the weather doesn't cooperate, like it hasn't been, then it could be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see. I'm sure we'll we'll find out about it pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, the COG has stepped up and they're helping with transporting um, weather observers and volunteers up to the observatory for now. So that, that's plan, mm-hmm. they're using plan B so they can get access to uh, the summit building. So no issues yeah, there. Yeah, that's interesting. But, yeah. Wow. Um, and then what, how, how bad was the rain? It's been raining like crazy. I know we got like three inches of rain down here over the course of last yeah. weekend. So I'm assuming you must have got the same. Uh, yeah, last weekend was the the biggest part of it. The last few days up here in the Southern Whites has essentially been about an inch and a half maybe, but it's been sparse and just sort of spread out with just intermittent clearing and things like that. So it's been odd up here, but I think we're at the tail end of it for sure. Yeah. Uh, today was fun. It's still raining out there, unfortunately, but it's been a wet one. Yeah. It's been depressing since I got back from yeah. Florida. It's been just gray and kind of drizzly and gross out. Yeah. Yep. All right. So along with that, New Hampshire Fishing Game has put out a, an advisory around spring hiking. They've said, be aware, be prepared, be responsible when hiking this spring so um, they want to get the word out that people need to be aware of their physical limitations, the weather forecast, and know when to turn back. Still a lot of winter-like conditions um, present at higher elevations. You need micro spikes, waterproof layers. Um, somebody had commented on one of the social media. I think it was Philip Warner, section hiker. He was like, basically, this is perfect hypothermia weather going on right now. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's still snowing trace amounts up there yeah so you need all that winter stuff still yeah stomp so i thought that it would be a good idea to go through um a little bit so we we start the show off with the higher summit forecast and we always talk about sort of looking at the weather so we always say like you know look at the 
you know, the, the local weather on your phone, take a look at the higher summit forecast. You can take a look at mountain forecast and you can kind of get a sense of the weather across all of those different sources. But one of the things that we don't, we haven't highlighted that much is the need for people to take a look at the stream flow data that's available through the, um, through the national water information system. So, um, Mm-hmm. There's a there's a website that you can go on that will give you um, gauge height and then stream flow discharge data. And you can use that information to judge the safety of river crossings. So we'll include this in the show notes. A lot of times, really, like the way you pay, when you should pay attention to this the most is like after... Uh, during the spring when you've got melting and you've got significant rain events and then anytime you've got other significant rain events, the rivers swell very quickly. So I think typically like if you get more than an inch of rain in the summertime or two inches of rain, like the the flow can increase significantly and make it dangerous for crossings, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes you'll see people that get stuck, uh, unable to cross back to a trail uh, to continue down and we'll get a call, but um, it can happen fast. Yeah, and the other the other thing that sort of didn't happen much that I'm aware of, or at least we didn't hear about it this season, was you know the snow melt or snow dams bursting and coming downstream and whatnot. So none of that happening that I was aware of this year. But uh, the water's a huge issue right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean the the pictures that have come through. So the um, lower falls into um, Conway was all, I think over the riverbanks. Um, I know that the East Branch of the Pemi has been running crazy hot. I think didn't you were you out looking at um one of the one of the rivers? Did you do like a live or something on the Instagram? Yeah, we went live at the the base of the Mad River, which is down by uh, the Campton Campton Dam. So it's just a really neat overlook, and uh, it was raging. Um, I've seen it higher, like probably three or four feet higher, coming actually up onto forty nine. So it was impressive, but not as bad as it's been in the past. Yeah, yeah. I saw some crazy pictures of Sunday River. I think it had, it had, it had flooded down uh, down in Sunday River and up in New Newry in that area. But um, mm-hmm. this website that I'll link in the show notes, it's again, it's called the National Water Information System. And what it provides is current conditions for stream flow. There's 105 sites that are available in New Hampshire. So what happens is they put these gauges into the river and then they can collect data. And the two key pieces of data that they'll collect is the gauge height. Basically, you know, how high the gauge is, um, is reading that the water is hitting. And then they'll also um, provide the, the discharge rate. And then there's also a long-term median flow. So you can kind of look at the discharge rate look at the median flow and get a sense on how much over the average um, things are running right now. And Mm -hmm. rivers do tend to like blow up quickly and then go down quite a bit. So a lot of these graphs are, um, they're very spiky. So you can just assume like there's weather events that have happened. Um, the, the, The gauge stations that I tend to focus on the most when I'm trying to figure out where, you know, if it's safe or not is, you know, anything tied to the Androscoggin, you've got like four different spots on the Androscoggin that you can consider if you're going to be going up north. There's a mm-hmm. Peabody River gauge um, in Gorham as well. You've got the Saco River Basin. So you've got one in Conway, one in Bartlett, and then one down south in Tamworth that you can take a look at. And then yeah. I feel like the East Branch of the Pemi, that's sort oh, of like going on the higher summits forecast. Like if you look at that one, absolutely, you can get like a, you can get a pretty good idea of what What's the rest of out. the river crossings are. Um, yeah. And what, absolutely. And what I'll typically do is I'll, I'll pivot it over to like a one year graph just to give me the perspective of what the averages are in a, over the course of a one year. Mm-hmm. The reading typically defaults to the gauge height. Which, which is good. It'll tell you like, oh yeah, the, the, the river is up. But for me, I think when I'm looking to judge like how dangerous a river crossing is going to be, I'll typically pivot it over to the stream flow, which is essentially a measurement of how many cubic feet per second is the, um, the river currently running at. And like the volume. Yeah, exactly. So in the East Branch, it's pretty... It's pretty typical, like you can sort of look at it and say like on average, if you're below like 600 
um, cubic feet per second, typically that means it's a pretty safe um, crossing. And then anything that gets around double of that starts to get pretty sketchy. So right now it's running around 1,500 cubic mm-hmm. um, feet per second. So I think it spiked at, uh, I want to say, let me just see here. It spiked up at 6,600 square feet uh, or cubic feet per wow. second. That was like three days ago. And now right. it's gone down significantly. Um, it spiked up a little bit uh, yesterday and now it's gone down again. So um, hmm. if you're going to be doing any crazy hikes in the, especially like in the Pemi wilderness going out, like I saw somebody was talking about, oh, I might go out to Owl's Head. Like, no, not today, not this weekend. It's running too hot and you're not going to want to go through there. You want to look to see if it's below like 600, you know, between 600 and 1200 means it's going to be an interesting day. And then anything mm-hmm. below that means it's probably just going to be a pretty easy water crossing. And you can see historically on these graphs, like how things peak out. And I can tell you within the last 12 months, um, the, the only other high reading that we've seen was um, there was one that came back at 8,800 cubic feet per second. And then, yeah, this this other reading that we got is, you know, 66. So it's pretty much the second worst flow that we've seen in the last 12 months happen this weekend. Yeah. So. Incredible. The power of water. Yes. Yeah. And at, at some points, the kink was closed on Monday due to significant flooding and washouts on the Conway side. I think they're mostly reopened as of now. Um, so you can drive over the Kang, no problem. And like we said, the, the, these tend to spike and then go down pretty quickly, but you do need to like really pay attention to them. Hmm. Um, well, they say we needed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely needed it. We'll have some nice grass. A couple of suggestions on safe hikes that you can use to avoid uh, water crossings. Mike Masel had posted this on social media, so I'm stealing from him, but I'll give him credit. And you can give your opinion, but um, he had said Cannon from the tram up Kinsman Ridge is one that you don't, it, you'll be hiking up a, up a waterfall, but you won't be dealing with any crossings. Right. Um, Mariah from Bangor Street up um, up that trailhead there. Um, Whiteface out and back. And, you know, the, obviously the ledges will be a little bit wet, but um, if you want to do a loop, you can come down Dicey's Mill, but there's a big giant like log that you'd have to go over. So that's a little sketchy, but you can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, he talks about the Wildcats up and down Polecat, uh, Flume and Liberty via Osseo, because that, that avoids pretty much everything because you go up on the, um, the ridge to avoid the river crossings there. Sure. Um, Pierce and Eisenhower via Crawford Path and then Wombach. But again, Crawford Path and Wombach are going to be like, you'll essentially be hiking in a river, but Mm -hmm. it will be manageable. And then Lafayette via Old Bridal um, probably won't have any big crossings either. But again, it's so those are some ideas of 4,000 footers that you can hit if you got to get a 4,000 footer. Right. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many options. There are tons of trails without uh, crossings. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, Owl's Head, Hancock's, um, what other ones that I, oh, uh, uh, Liberty Flume from the, the 93 side. Avoid that. Yeah, they're all bad news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kinsman. For sure. Uh, Kinsman's, I think, is bad, right? Kinsman's from what side? I mean, you, you Lonesome Lake up to the Kinsman's. I don't think there's any major problem. Okay. That I recall. Uh, I mean, there's one bridge crossing. Uh, lower down by the campground, Lafayette campground. Uh, the other side might be a bit tricky, but I don't quite recall. I haven't hiked over there in quite a while. Okay. Um, yeah. And it calls into question, like even Chikora, you yeah, know, from certain trails you, you would have to avoid. Yeah. You know, if you, you've got the falls and this and that. So, but. Interesting. Interesting. Let's dive into some White Mountains history, shall we? Well, Stomp, this whole uh, river crossing and all this drama got me uh, to dig down a little rabbit hole around the creation of the White Mountains National Forest. 
And mm-hmm. um, I had no idea about this history, but I did some digging. I was on like a Plymouth State website and I didn't realize that the, um, the, the sort of scientific act of measuring stream flow and river flow was actually the, the final straw that was um, set in place to allow for the creation of the White Mountain National Forest. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So let me tell you the story, and then you can hop in with any questions you have at any any time. But let's go back to eight, the eighteen sixties, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you gotta like um, pretend you're in the eighteen sixties. Get your little house in the prairie suspenders three, going and <laughs> three piece suit. Yes, yeah, three piece suit, <laughs> yeah, three piece suit, and all that stuff. So um, <laughs> by the eighteen sixties, um, the, the state of New Hampshire had gone on this um, fire sale of public land. So they were looking to fund education and there was a lot of different programs that they were looking to fund. So they were using um, the sale of public land uh, to fund a lot of the needs that they had of the citizens that were mostly living sort of in Southern New Hampshire. Um, So there's an organization called the Land Trust of New Hampshire that was headquartered out of Connecticut had about 250 shareholders, um, but over the years, like it it sort of became owned and operated by just a few, a handful of sort of lumber barons. Um, The most well-known lumber baron in the area, he originally operated up in Zeeland, but then came down into Lincoln is James Henry and his family. I think he had two sons that work with him. Um, And they basically had a model where they would, you know, they would, they would be acquiring large tracts of land. They would then strip that land clean, and you you know they would have they would basically have lumber mills, and they would sell to a lot of customers in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, to to do building because it was a huge building um, boom. But what they were doing was when they were acquiring these large tracts of land. They essentially started freezing out any of the smaller property owners. So there was a bunch of different farmers. And basically the model was that the farmers would own small plots of land. They would farm Mm -hmm. those lands out. And eventually, like if the land became like unfarmable because they had certain crops that would need to be cycled over for a couple of years. Yeah. They didn't have the money to purchase like land to set aside they were doing like a just-in-time scenario so for a lot of these farmers their motto was like farm in the you know three seasons and then over the winter they would work their lumber mills they would have small lumber mills and that would that would be how they would survive they had a little bit of money they would want to buy additional tracts of land around their farms and they used to be able to do that up until around the you know the 18 by the 1890s what had happened was that um you know, these lumber barons were acquiring tracts of land and they were basically positioning it so that they wouldn't even consider selling land to anybody unless you were buying a minimum of 10,000 acres. Mm. So you had like this 20, 30 year period where these farmers um, slowly but surely got kind of choked out and they would basically say they would starve out and they had a choice. They would basically either uh, move on to somewhere else or they would say to their sons and, and children, like, hey, you got to move off the farm. We're going to just manage it on our own because we can't purchase any more land and we can't survive. So you had a lot of son, a lot of the, the farmer's sons moving down into the city or doing something else, joining the army. Or they could basically work for somebody like James Henry and essentially become you know, part of the the logging operation and essentially live in these communities like Lincoln that were essentially like, yeah, we'll give you housing, we'll give you food, we'll give you everything, but pretty much yeah. like you're working to pay for the rent to live there, the food that yeah. you're eating. And um, so from hmm. 1860 to the 1890s, there was this bitterness that was coming through because these local farmers were considered like the natives. And it's kind of interesting. Some of the the, right. the documents that you read from the 1900s, they talk about like pushing the natives off their land. And what they mean is these small farmers that settled the land in the mm-hmm. 1800s. The other issue that was going on is that um, tourism was becoming popular and there was a lot of um, the hotels and um, the guide services that were involved in business that relied on making their money over the summer, 
the forest operations, the lumbermen were um, starting to block off access to a lot of the tourist locations as well. So hotels couldn't buy land to expand their operations, and then they couldn't take their tourist guests to certain areas because the lumber barons wouldn't allow them access to it, or they were literally just like cutting across trails, and they wouldn't let mm-hmm. anybody on the property. So there was a, mm-hmm. like a lot of... It's the same old story. Like these oligarchs, oh, yeah. they overplay right. their power and they just keep screwing the little guy over and over and over again until it reaches a boiling point. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. I yeah. wonder what was going on politically well, in the state, just in a state state basis rather than federal. So we're heading that direction. Yeah, exactly. Your story. Yeah. So by the 1890s, President Harrison had started designating forest regions. Um, And what he was doing was he was sort of recognizing that there was this interest in conservation. Most of his focus on designating these forest regions was focused on out west because it was a lot easier for them to manage because the federal government owned so much property out west that they could easily designate certain areas. Where it got difficult was in the East because they realized like, hey, we've sold all of our land to these individual private operations. How are we going to get that land back? Because first of all, the government doesn't have the money to fund it. And then second of all, um, you know, we're relying on the the lumber operations. And then third of all, these lumber barons are not going to be easy to deal with. You know, they're basically buying this land for pennies, but when you want to buy back from them, they're selling it at a premium. So mm-hmm. it, it was it was very difficult. But what happened was one reverend used the printing press to change the course of all the events that were going on in New Hampshire. And we can actually thank this guy for the White Mountains being the way they are now. Um, and this okay. this single reverend was, you know, and, and so just to step back for a second, by the 1890s, the New Hampshire Land Trust had basically denuded most of the land. So they ripped up, they, they cut across all these large tracts. Um, they had already squeezed out the farmers that relied on sawmill activity in the winter. Nobody could buy land unless they purchased huge tracts of it. Thornton, New Hampshire had lost like 12% of their population between 1890 and 1900. Children and farmers were forced to move away. um, Well, these lumbermen from Quebec were coming in and making good money. Um, And also they were, you know, the tourism was being impacted by the lumber trust at this point. The other thing that was going on is towns couldn't, they couldn't attract doctors to come up. No doctors would live there because they're like, I can't find housing. And then there's nobody to pay me there. So there's no reason for me to come up anymore. So essentially everyone's getting starved out at the, um, you know, at the mercy of these lumber barons. So by 1900, Mm -hmm. Reverend John Edgar um, publishes a document called the Boer Constrictor of New Hampshire. So uh, nice. yeah, Reverend John Johnson, I'm sorry. So the Boa Constrictor of New Hampshire, he publishes this across a number of different publications, the most prominent one being the New England Homestead magazine, which was published out of Springfield, Massachusetts, five cents a copy. Mm-hmm. And what the Boa Constrictor was is it's a seven, oh no, it's an 11 page document. Um, and essentially what, um, what it was known as is a broadside. So this is a type of printed document that's basically going after like we we talk about like all the cable news stuff and all these like talking heads that go after people like this is exactly what he was doing it was he was using the printed um, story to basically say sort of the same old story we're dealing with now is that elite businessmen are pushing out settlers they're starving them out their sons are forced to move away he basically mm-hmm. went down the list one by one about all the things that I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, basically he's an activist. Yeah. Activist. Exactly. And then this was enough to get like, there was some additional magazines that followed up in support of the boa constrictor. Um, and then this is where, um, I think his name's Senator John Weeks. He was then able to pull together organizations like the Wanna Lancet um, Outdoor Club, um, a number of different religious groups. That's the other thing, too, is that the religious um, movement around this is something that's interesting because you think of religion as sort of like just, you know, they're about their own interests. But the reverends around that time were really like they had a moral authority. So I think a sure. lot of them felt compelled, like, you know, 
we need to speak up on behalf of our citizens. So they were much more politically active or more comfortable being politically active that way. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Yeah. The well-being of the, their flock. Yeah, exactly. So um, so the boa constrictor of, white, of the White Mountains article um, received a bunch of follow-up in support uh, by stakeholders in the New England Homestead Magazine. They were able to pull together concerned parties and lobby Congress for protection and um, approval for buyback of the land. So it, it was a 10-year process starting in 1900 with the Boa Constrictor article and then pulling together all these interested parties to finally get Congress, the federal government, to pass the Weeks Act in 1911. Right. Yeah. So yep. we've always said like, okay, once the weak act, weak act um, is passed, then magically like the White Mountain National Forest and all these different um, um, national parks started becoming, you know, a, a thing. But that's not exactly what happened is that mm-hmm. they were fighting this Weeks Act all the way up to the very end. And even after it was passed... The Weeks Act did not guarantee that there was going to be the establishment of the National Forest because they still needed to appropriate the money in order to buy back the land to establish the um, the forest. So it's one of those deals where it's like, wow. yeah, you can pass the law, but we're not going to fund it. Sure. Right. So this is where river gauge uh, readings and stream cross and, and stream flow comes into it is that the last piece of the puzzle in order to get the budget appropriated to fund the purchase back of the land to establish the White Mountain National Forest um, was due to what's called the stream flow controversy. Mm -hmm. And this was an issue about whether the floods and low summer flows that were being seen along like the Merrimack and the southern uh, parts of these uh, these large streams were due to the activity that was going on in the forest. So um, the question was whether or not like de- denuding these hillsides that covered large areas of the White Mountains, were they impacting um, the way that river w- the river was flowing deep sure. into like the mills? So like, you know, think about Lawrence and Lowell and all these critical mill towns. Um, mm-hmm. So on one corner stood the forestry leaders and, um, basically saying like it didn't. And then the other side was the Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Weather Bureau. So what happened is they they commissioned a fascinating study that was made um, by using 10 stream gauging stations in the White Mountains. Some of the stream gauges were in Waterville Valley. Others were in the Pemigewasset Valley watershed. And there's still remains of some of these stream gauges that are standing a century later um, as somewhat forgotten shrines in, you know, they're overgrown with moss and vegetation, but you can still find some of them. Benton McKay worked as a forester studying the stream flow problem and later became famous for proposing the creation of the Appalachian Trail. Um, so this scientific study normally would have taken many years for them to determine the impact of the clear cutting of the forest to the flow of the the rivers, uh, but the public was very impatient so that they received preliminary results determining uh, that at the Burnt Brook site near Thoreau Falls, they found that the cutover and burned over areas um, ended up melting snow faster in the spring. Therefore, the True. stream flow could be affected. And this preliminary and somewhat weak result was enough to convince the, the, the remaining members of Congress that were holding out that they should begin the appropriations to acquire the land in the White Mountains. So without that study, hmm. they, don't, they can't push the ball down the hill to acquire the land. Yeah, so who, who commissioned the study? Uh, it was commissioned by the Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Gotcha. Weather Bureau. Okay. So the forestry... Um, stakeholders were all saying like there's no impact and the army corps of engineers was like there's definitely an impact here and it's causing issues with the way that the river's flowing way downstream so there was this argument going on and you know who whether or not like it it proved anything is kind of irrelevant it was sort of a perfunctionary like we have to do this study in order to get the results that we want so that we can convince the members of congress that are holding out to vote for it interesting yeah that's fascinating yep who knew so stomp when you think about river gauges it's not just about safety it's also about the creation of the 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 forest that we love yeah that's amazing 
I, thinking about that, like um, that's why you see so much new growth uh, in the forests because the land up here was just decimated by these lumber organizations. Like you go into Waterville Valley and just hike down Livermore. It's all new growth. There's, there's no old growth around. Oh yeah. And you can you see know. it too. Like I was up on self moat and you can look out across that. You can see swaths of um, land that's like thick forest. And then you can see these big swaths of, of uh, trees that are like newer mm. and you can kind of see through them and you can yeah, just see babies. where the forestry is being done. Yeah. And it reminds me of big pines uh, off of Livermore. If you want to see what the trees would be looking like uh, had they not been clear cut. Um, Big Pines is a great example. It's very stunning. Yeah. Sorry, Stump. I'm but talking anyway. a lot today. Hey, it's all good. Was that interesting it's or all, did I yeah. bore you? No, it's fascinating. Yeah, it ties right into everything we're talking about too. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, all right, so moving on to the next things here, we want to give a shout out to the Trailhead Steward Program. They had volunteer trainers met last week to plan for the season. I think they had like 100 people. Oh, Wow. That's it. That's pretty cool. So I wonder how many they've had in the prior years. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I know. Mm-hmm. I think that they set up at like six or eight different trailheads. So like Piper Trail, uh, Welsh Dickey, mm-hmm. Franconia, um, I have a b- bunch of different trails. I forget. Yeah. Um, Amanusik, yeah. uh, Pinkham Notch. That's great. Yeah. I'm sure there's uh maybe they'll be able to set up uh, more spots. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but I do think, like, I, I remember looking at the data and seeing, like, the six most common places where he, search and rescues were happening, and they have them all covered. So it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, okay, next up, Stomp, you put this note in here. So our friend Larson had just beat his 24-hour Monadnock record. So you want to <laughs> break down that? This is craziness. Nuts? Yeah, so I, I forget when the um, the last one happened a couple of years back, and WMUR covered it, but um, his last record was 16 laps within 24 hours. So he did it, he, he added two additional laps, which is pretty stunning. That's a huge jump. So he holds the record for 18 laps in 24 hours on Monadnock. He's it's not exactly picking like the best weather conditions to do this on either. I think, I think looking at his pictures, he had a good window though. He just picked the right day. I think it was the tail end of that really warm stretch, if I was uh, not mistaken. Yeah. But congrats, Larson. Yeah. He would have done it in the rain anyway. What are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh yeah. No doubt about it. Like you know, <laughs> super impressive. So yeah. Keep breaking those records. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, me and you were like barely living through, through training of Mount Washington <laughs> here. How, how's everything going with your training? It's going good. I'm getting out daily. Um, I've just sort of mixed it up for the first three or four weeks I've been doing. Um, over in the Waterville Estates, uh, off of exit 28 here, there's two miles worth of about, It's it's got to be at least 40 degree grade, 40 degree to 50 degree grade on several sections of this two mile uphill stretch. So I've been really doing that a lot, but today I, I just added in um, the sandwich notch road to get more of the distance like you've been doing. Mm-hmm. So it's trying to up my mileage uh, because my Washington road race, there, there is not a lot of that extreme uh, grade. You know, it's pretty gradual and 12% average grade is not too bad. But it's those sharp ones that you got to be ready for. So I'm trying to mix it up now. I feel good. I started out with a couple injuries like um, peroneal down by the ankles. They were getting a little sore. So I stretched the hell out of my feet, got, took care of that. And then I was dealing with patella tendonitis on my right knee and I took care of that. So it's been a wild trip. <laughs> How about you? What you been up to for training? I've been doing doubles. I've actually been like doing my normal five mile runs in the morning. And then uh, after dinner, I've been hitting the treadmill on elevation and just mostly oh, like, wow. doing a little bit of running, a little bit of walking. I've been doing like three miles, two and a half miles uphill on the treadmill. So, uh, but nice. I've, been, I've been losing a lot of weight. So I'm down, I think, 13 pounds as of... Um, as of today, I've been kind of plateaued a little bit the last week, week and a half, because I went to Florida and that kind of screwed me up, but I'm down from 170 to 157 right now and I'm going down to 150, so. Jeez. Um, yeah, skinny. Oh, it sucks. I'm like, so are you still dieting? I'm dieting, yeah, yeah. I'm just basically eating a lot of protein, not a lot of carbs and, you know. Yeah. But you know what? My energy is fine and 
Uh, I'm not craving like I was before, so I'm getting used to it. Like it's just calorie deficit a little bit. Like I'm probably eating around 1,200 calories a day, and then uh, you know. So is your ultimate that. end to try to beat your time? No, I just wanted to like I, I definitely put on some weight over the winter, and okay. I was feeling it, you know. And I could see like like I was looking at my heart rate. Like average heart rate has gone down six beats per minute in the last like. Oh, there you eight go. weeks and like, you know, it just didn't feel healthy. Like, you know, my pants were a little tighter than I like. So, um, gotcha. but I'm probably not doing like, I'm probably not losing weight the way that you should be doing it. Like I don't, I used to be a wrestler. So I would like, I'd be like, all right, I got to cut weight. So that's how I look at it is like, I'm going to cut weight, get to my goal weight and then maintain it. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure I'll gain weight afterwards. But if I can go on, <laughs> if I can start at 150, I feel like I'll have a better time, but I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm probably going to hang with you at the start and then see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about uh, pole position too. Like, I'm going to put myself pretty much in the back, in the rear third or so, because yeah. I just don't want to. I, you know, you just get caught up in the adrenaline so much at that first start. I don't want that to happen. I want to ease into it nice and easy, and then it'll be good to go. I think I'll be locked in if I start at the right pace. Yeah. Yeah. And like for anyone that hasn't run Mount Washington, if you're this, you're getting ready for your first time, like it gets claustrophobic in the beginning because you have oh, like yeah. the start. It's fine with the start. Like you've got a wide, but like when you get on the road for that first mile or so, it's, it's very tight and everyone's sort of clustered together and you'll have like, people don't see themselves correctly. Like you'll have one person that's like walking in the middle of the road, super slow. And like, you've got to get around them. And like, (laughs) you'll have like, sometimes you'll have like two or three people walking together and blocking it. It gets annoying. Like the first mile and a half is annoying. Um, so that's reminding me. I mean, I mean, I literally have visceral memories of dodging people trying to get through that crowd. Yeah. It's, it's, it's annoying. People have no, um, sort of self-awareness on that stuff. But um, what's what's the plan for, are you getting your, your number the day before or are you just going to go up that morning and get it? I was planning on just showing up that morning. Um, you know, I'm coming up with uh, Grandpa Stomp. So we'll just leave early and get there and grab all the uh, tags and whatnot for the drivers. Okay. Are you going to yeah. bring the slasher um, banner? I could. Could do that. Do we have a place to put that? Well, I think the way you can park... And then you can bring chairs and then set up like, is grandpa stomp? Is he going to be driving up? Yes. So so we we could, I mean, we could set up like a, I could bring some stuff to set up. That'd be great. Yeah. Then we can get like um, a little crew together and do all that fun stuff. So we're going to drive down. We're not hiking down now. Is that what's going on? I, yeah. I mean, I, I plan to just drive down just for safety. I don't want to push it. Okay. I'll much. see how I do, but I'll give you my ticket and then you can, you can take my stuff up. So I have like, sure. So yeah, you know, it's like the weather and all the, just the other factors you have to consider. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. All right. Well, moving on here, Stomp. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun day. Yeah, but uh, moving on here, we had reports on one of the Facebook groups out of uh, Connecticut. So this is Hiking in Connecticut. Shout out to our friend John who sent us this. Had an interesting encounter today hiking at Bear Rock in Durham. A guy hiking in his tidy whiteies and nothing else. <laughs> Is it, the, is it the guy from Zealand Hut? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm like, is he really hiking and nothing else? Like he doesn't have boots on or like trail runners? Come on. <laughs> so man, people are funny. Yeah. What would you do if you ran into somebody like that? Oh, I don't know. I mean, prior experience, I dealt with those nudist hikers up on uh, bald faces and I, I cowered behind a rock until they passed. I did too. I tapped out. I was like, I'm out of here. So I like probably talk a tough game on the podcast and be like, so what's over the outfit? But I, I would run yeah. away. So. Yeah, well, yeah. In this day and age, I'm not going to mess around with somebody in their, their undies. Like, okay. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of folks doing unique things on hikes for attention and notoriety and whatnot, but uh, I think there might be a limit. Yeah. Yeah. So I think naked hiking day is coming up or whatever. And like, oh, for the AT. Or I don't think it's the AT. I think it's just naked hiking day is like a national holiday. Um, oh, okay. I'll warn people like, if I'm hiking with my kids and you'll like show up naked, like, it's going to be a problem. So, Keep your clothes on and make sure you have like, you're listening because it's, uh, that's not cool. But anyway, <laughs> right. 
Um, <laughs> next story here, Stomp, I pulled a couple of stories that, I'm, uh, that sort of don't fall in search and rescue, but are interesting. So an Italian hiker discovers 2,000-year-old buried treasure. So this is cool. I'll put this in the show notes. Yeah, I read this one. It's pretty neat. Yeah. So an, an Italian hiker from an archaeological group discovered a buried treasure that dates back to as early as 157 BC. So this is like, um, yeah, this is like before the birth of Jesus and everything. So yeah, um, yeah. The hiker Incredible. made this discovery while walking through newly cut forest northeast of the Tuscan city of Livorno. So they noticed shiny objects on the forest floor and they stopped to investigate. Uh, they ended up finding 175 ancient Roman coins called denarii. Um, mm -hmm. These coins, which were found along with remnants of a terracotta pot, would be worth tens of thousands of dollars in today's currency. I feel like they would be worth more. Um, Probably. But they, they speculate the coins have been hidden. Uh, they were likely constituted like a treasure or a piggy bank. They were likely buried. And uh, speculation is they either belong to a soldier or they would have belonged to some kind of a businessman. So a number of people at the time buried their stash of money for whatever reason to prevent it from uh, being retrieved. Um, so tough to tough to trace what was going on here. Probably somebody mm -hmm. just trying to hide it from the tax man. Possible. Yeah, yeah. that's a good possibility. Yeah. So you never know what you're going to find out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then the last one I have here, Stomp, is there's a follow up to a story that we did um, probably about a year and a half ago, a situation where a hiker was hiking in Bellingham, Washington, and got into a fight with a mountain biker over you know some kind of an argument. And the 70 year old hiker ended up stabbing the mountain biker guy. Um, Cause that's how it goes. Hmm. It's basically like car drivers, pedestrians, and then everybody hates the cyclists. So um, the hiker <laughs> ended up stabbing the cyclist and I think he got bicycle rights. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he got one month of home detention and has to pay $3,700 of restitution to the victim. So hmm. I don't know. I bet he probably said that was worth it. Oh yeah, probably. <laughs> wow, man. Yeah. People are unhinged. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in home confinement. So he's probably got like a, a nice bracelet. Speaking of which, I have a mm -hmm. story. I forgot. I didn't tell you this. Oh yeah. I your, was your like criminal past. I know. Like I, I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> so when I was in Florida, like you, I hike on these beaches, right? And mm -hmm. these, these guys set up on the beach, like they set these big fishing rods up and they stick them in the, they stick a, like a PVC pipe in the sand. And then they, they cast the fishing rod out from the beach. You, have you seen this? It's called shore casting. Yes. Like, yeah. Yep. I, when I first moved up to where I live, like my buddy was like, oh, we'll go to Plum Island and we're going to catch fish and it'll be great and blah, blah, blah. So we go, <laughs> we can catch any fish. And I'm like, this isn't great. I'm like, it's not fun and all this. Then he was like, oh, we have to like measure, we have to do, like we have to go when the tide is like a certain thing. So that was like, mm -hmm. all right, well then he's like, but it's going to be four in the morning. So I'm like, all right, well, we'll go. So then it was like, we didn't catch anything. And I'm like, this is not fun. Then he was like, oh, but we have to go when the moon is like full and then the tide is a certain thing. So I'm like, all right, I'll go. <laughs> tried that. And uh, this is before I had kids. So I had a lot of like, I could, I was up to a lot of nonsense, but uh, I was like, this is not fun. We're not catching any fish. So ever since then, I'm like anti like these people fishing. And when you, when you're in Florida, <laughs> they have their fishing rods on the, the beach and like you, you're going to take your head off. Like sometimes if you don't pay attention, cause you, the lines go across the beach. So oh, anyway, sure. this yeah. one guy, I watched him every morning. I went every morning and I'm like watching this guy like a hawk. He's got like nine fishing rods set up. And I'm like, where's the nine guys that are like manning these fish? It was one guy. Hmm. He was there every morning and he had like a big ankle bracelet. So he must have been on like house arrest or something. Oh, and I'm geez. like, this guy's got the best life ever. He's on house arrest. He's fishing with nine fishing rods. He's got like his music blaring. And I'm pretty sure he was drinking like a beer at like nine in the morning when I was, I was hiking. So or when I was walking wow. on the beach. Send it, huh? I'm like, Gee don't whiz. they test these guys for alcohol when they're on their ankle bracelets? Yeah. I'm wondering if there are any local rules about how many rods you can have set up. 
I don't know. That sounds like a pretty basic type of conservation uh, registry. You would think so, but I wasn't going to get into the argument with ankle bracelet guy over (laughs) breaking the law. (laughs) He'd probably strangle you with some fishing wire. Yeah, exactly. Um, All right, stop. So that's all we got for the opener. So I think you got to do some uh, advertisement here. Yeah, Sponsors. let's talk about CS Instant Coffee. Zero waste instant coffee that comes in compostable packets. Perfect for the trail and home. Each packet makes about 20 ounces of coffee. So you can take one of them on an overnight trip and it makes two pretty good sized cups of coffee. Put it in your backpack, boil up some hot water, and you're good to go. Learn more by going to our show notes or Google CS Instant Coffee at www.csinstant.coffee. And time's ticking here. We're getting closer to the Alzheimer's event. And um, hike to fight Alzheimer's with 48 Peaks, a fundraising and awareness event for the Alzheimer's Association. Join 450 plus hikers this summer as we hike New Hampshire's 4,000 footers or create your own hiking adventure from a 52 of the view to a Prezi Traverse or climb your favorite mountain. Together, we will paint the mountains purple and raise vital funding to advance the care, support, and research efforts of the Alzheimer's Association. Visit alts.org. It's A-L-Z dot org, right slash 48 peaks to learn more. And that's the number 48. Uh, get your stickers at Ski Fanatics and, of course, Spinners in Andover off Dascom Road. And um, we have some coffee donations. Actually, we have one that just came in the other day from Valley Bear Running Club. They donated 10 coffees. And apparently, it's a local Route 49 connection here in Thornton, Campton. So, uh, thank you for the donation, guys and gals. And uh, we really appreciate it. And um, it's been a little while. We try to squeeze these plugs into to our other supporters. We have... Reckless Brewery, of course, which will be hosting that Alzheimer's event coming up. What What's the date on that? Is that? I forget the date. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the information for sure. Um, but Reckless, where you'll enjoy the best food, craft beer, and fun. Just 15 minutes from Franconia Notch, many 4,000 footers, and less than 10 minutes from the Five Corners. And of course, EMS, your Northeast go-to for outdoor gear, guidance, education, and more since 1967 at ems.com. Yeah, and just to um, add to the reckless, I think I saw an advertisement they're doing some kind of a dog parade. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, huh. go check that out on their Facebook page. I'll try to link that with... Yeah. Um, with us, and then I know for Alzheimer's, the longest day is on the twenty first. Stop at Reckless. Um, uh, don't quote the me on post, that one. Yeah, the post event, I believe, is at Reckless. Um, so you said what date? Twenty first is the longest day. Okay, but the celebration is June tenth. I have it written down. Got anyway, it. we'll Got figure it. it out. Okay, yeah, we'll clarify that on our uh, our post. Yeah, for sure. Now, what's, uh, what's going on for hikes? Uh, what is going on for hikes? So I got rained out last Sunday. I was supposed to go to the Bell Naps, and then, uh, but it was just ridiculously raining. Um, so I just said, forget it. I don't want to like, um, you know, I, wa- I want to have a fun time when I'm out there, and I don't want to just get soaked. So I just bailed on it. So I don't have anything going on. I'm going to try to get out this weekend, mm-hmm. either the Bell Naps or see if my daughter wants to get a 4,000-footer going. But I think she's got plans, so. Nice. Yeah. Well, how, what's going on with the car situation? You're still looking at not having enough vehicle coverage to get up north? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> if anybody, like, so if anybody's <laughs> listening and they want to sell like a, a nice used Subaru at a good price or they're looking to trade their car in, hit me up. I'm, I'm in the market for <laughs> something I got to buy for my daughter. So oh, That's classic. Oh, that's so funny. Man, broke as hell. Yeah, you can bump some rides. Yes. We'll pick you up. Yep. I'm like, <laughs> Nobby, come pick me up. <laughs> oh, he would in a yes. heartbeat. It's yep. like, it's on the way. It is. So. Might as well. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, Vagabond this is, summer. Yeah, totally. That's great. So, Mrs. Stump and I did the old man um, site up um, on Cannon. It's like 12, 1,200 feet up. And uh, good timing. We didn't realize that it was the 20th anniversary, which was yesterday, May 3rd. So it's sort of a do-do-do-do type of moment. 
um, it's awesome up there. Um, it's an ass kicker. It's a climber's trail that um, is very, very steep, but the payoff, the view is incredible. And uh, it was just a really nice hike. And uh, while we were going up there, we took a look across the way uh, at Eagle Cliff to look at the rock slide that happened last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, dude, from up there, you, you get this vantage and you could actually see that the the slide itself made it down to Greenleaf Trail, if not past that, really? which is really scary to think about. Oh, yeah. It's like um, the pictures, you've probably seen them. You can see the like the talus, the rock slide, mm-hmm. and then blow down after blow down after blow down straight down to Greenleaf. Like, wow. Interesting. Because I know we, we, when we did the Watcher one time, remember we with Nick, um, we came down that way. So you could have, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if we went that far, but like you definitely could have got wiped out doing that. Oh, sure. And it makes me nervous too, thinking about the recent earthquakes. Like I think there was a, a 2.0, 2.0 plus right here uh, a couple of days back. And that, that can trigger some wild stuff. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I know the area of the watcher Creepy. is like already loose. You know, it's a Super lot of fragile. Like, uh, yeah, it's very fragile. So like a 2.0 earthquake could knock something loose. So no I question. Mean, in some respects, like it's nice, if it's nice weather and you're going up there, like, you know, you're not thinking about an earthquake taking you out, but it is, it's just, that's not a stable area over there. So. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so we have some notable hikes, um, tag slasher on your adventure to be considered for our hike of the week. And uh, we have Sam Hikes, New Hampshire. She did Monadnock three times on spring break. Some serious tracing going on. Gwen Stratton, um, I guess she crossed paths with Larson while he was doing his 24-hour attempt on Monadnock. So she basically rode, she did up, down, all around Monadnock to avoid the snow up here up uh, in the Whites. Uh, Jakester did Gentian Pond on day one and then made it over the Mahusik to Cascade Mountain on day two. Uh, Hiking Heatherly. And geez, I guess they made it over to uh, southern Italy for some hikes around the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Gulf of Salerno, uh, just crushing it over there. Pictures looked amazing. Oh, yeah. Awesome. No kidding, right? Yeah. Eric Hansen, 42, did a Hale Zealand Bonds Traverse in spring conditions. So he, this brings him up to 570 out of 576 uh, for his grid, and he wow. gridded out April. And then finally, uh, Mountain Gem did Chikora via Hammond to Liberty. So that's our list for the week. Thanks for tagging us, everybody. Those are some impressive hikes. Um, I, I don't know. know if I could pick. I feel like 570 is impressive. The Italy hike yeah. is amazing. So. Right. Oh, runner up, huh? Yeah, yeah. Everybody gets a prize. Yeah. Gritting out April is impressive for anybody. Um, so good for them. Yeah, that's, that's true. I never thought about that. But yeah, some of these months are rough. Like, ugh. Really rough. Yeah. So um, we have another sponsor before we get into our next topic here. So Valcluse Gear. Want ventilation and less sweat on your back when backpacking? That's a yes. Check out Valcluse's backpack ventilation gear. Back sweat sucks in all types of weather and hikes. It's uncomfortable and a risk factor causing your core temperature to fluctuate if it doesn't evaporate off your back. Valcluse's ultralight ventilation backpack frame is an accessory that installs in your favorite pack 18 liters up to 55 liters, creating a ventilating airflow gap between you and your pack. They are releasing their Generation 2 frame right now, and uh, that only weighs about four ounces, apparently, which is super light and uh, can handle the heaviest pack loads. So whether you're in hot or cold temps or have a pack with a curved frame, the ultralight ventilation backpack frame is a real game changer. So visit ValkluseGear.com to order a ventilation frame today. Valkluse is a fan of the the show and uh, a sponsor. And uh, use a promo code SLASHER for a $10 discount. Yay! Excellent, excellent. So, yeah. Stomp, I think now we're going to go into our Guest of the Week segment here. So, we were able to record a session with with Carly from the New England Healing Sports Association. So, um, she was so gracious to join us to talk a little bit about this awesome organization. So, yeah. um, do you want to just drop into that segment and then we'll come back afterwards? Yeah, let's go. Slasher's Guest 
Twist of the week. Very cool. Very cool. Very, 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 very cool. All right, Carly. So uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Is this your first podcast? This is actually my second. So I've dabbled a little bit. Oh, oh yeah. How big How big was that other podcast? Well, huge, right? I don't it want was. them to hear this and say it wasn't. <laughs> All right. We have pressure. We have pressure. To We're going to try to be as good. So, so for the listeners, Carly's here to talk about uh, NESA, which is uh, the New England Healing Sports Association. And you are, what is your, what is your role within NESA? So I am the executive director of NESA. Okay. Is that the, um, is that the highest level that you can get to? If we're going levels, yes, this is the highest. I, I can't get much higher than this. Um, so, I, hey, I'm willing to stick around as long as our board of directors will, will have me. See, everybody has a boss stomp. Everybody yeah. has a boss. Like, she's got to report to the board of directors. Right. So, oh, yeah. It always works that way. Um, so, how do, you get, how do you get a job like this, Carly? Well, I, um, I actually got my degree in adapted physical activity. So my degree is working specifically with people with disabilities in the sport and recreation field. Um, part of my degree was getting an internship to complete my master's degree. And I actually ended up interning with Nessa and loved my internship. I did a summer internship. So we did kayaking and paddleboarding. I loved it so much. I, I like to think that the people I was working for at the time liked me because then they asked me to stay on uh, and they hired me as the program coordinator, which at that point, my job was to basically match up our volunteers with our athlete participants and get them in the sports or activities that they were interested in. So I was program coordinator for a little while, and then the job, the role of executive director became open. My old boss retired, and I applied, and thankfully, they they kept me around. So I've Hmm. kind of been through the stages here at NESA. Wow, that's so interesting. Like I, I, I'm a, I've told Stomp this before, but like I'm in recruiting, and I get a lot of people that will reach out to me, especially their 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 kids or whatever, and they'll say like, "Oh, my kids studied a certain thing, but they're not really sure that they want to go into that field." And I see that a lot with young people where they'll say like, "Okay, this is my major," but then they do something completely different. But you're the opposite. It sounds like you sort of knew early on what you wanted to do. What do you even remember? What attracted you to want to focus on this? Well, I did my undergrad in sports medicine and then I kind of I started working actually for a chiropractor and uh, there was a woman that would come to our office and she had a spinal cord injury and she was just she started telling me about all these sports activities she was doing and I was like, wow, that's actually really cool. So good old Google, I I jumped on Google that night after work and just started um, researching disabilities and sports and, and figured, Hey, you know what? I think I might want to go back to school and learn a little bit more about how I can get involved with this. This is really cool. Mm -hmm. So it was kind it wasn't exactly that I knew, you know, right away that I wanted to do it. It was just something that kind of piqued my interest and then I rolled with it. Got it. So you were sort of like somewhat irresponsibly. I just jumped right in. (laughs) Yeah, well, it turned out well for you. But okay, so then you sort of had a a similar uh, undergrad degree, but then this was a master's program that got you into the more specific field. Hmm. Interesting. So, can you talk a little bit about the history of Nessa? Like, what, um, how long has it been around, and what exactly, you know, caused this to uh, this organization to become created? Yeah. So we started in 1972 by a group of Vietnam War veterans. Uh, They were returning from war and this particular group really liked to ski. So some of them had new injuries. Some of them um, had new amputations, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't highly recognized then, but we now know it to be that now. Uh, So they were basically just kind of looking for a way to get back into the sport that they loved, skiing, and really be in a community with each other. You know, they wanted to still have those social opportunities in 
in skiing. So they banded together. They formed New England at the time. It was called New England Handicap Sportsmen's Association. Um, and then over the years, we've kind of evolved into not only serving uh, veterans, but we serve anybody with any disability. I always like to say from the ages of four to 104, we'll, we'll serve those folks. Um, and we don't always offer skiing. We don't only offer skiing now. We also offer uh, snowboarding, snowshoeing, kayaking, paddleboarding, hiking. Uh, so now we're a year-round adaptive sports program, wow. whereas in the beginning we, we did only skiing. And do you are there still uh, founders of the organization that are involved at this point? At this point, we have probably one or two people that are still slightly involved with the organization that have been with us since the beginning. Yeah, I'm sure they're getting a little older at this point. So, <laughs> um, and do you know, like, do you do you have any of the early equipment that they use, like, or is that, or is any of that been like donated to like New England ski? museums or anything like that we have some of so we have a whole bunch of equipment and some of our sit down skis so a, a piece of a device that somebody would use that maybe isn't able to stand up or maybe they sit in a wheelchair during their everyday life they use a piece of equipment called a sit ski we've got some of the older models of the sit ski though i don't think they're the ones from the beginning um, we do have plenty of pictures and, and kind of a notebook of history in our office so we can see kind of what that stuff looked like, but we don't have any right here in house. God, yeah, that would be so fascinating. And then do you, or can you give down, give a summary of sort of the act, the general activities that you focus on? Yeah, so we, we have year-round programming. Actually, today was supposed to be our start of our hike, our spring hiking season, but with the weather, it just we got rained out today. So our first day of hiking will be on Thursday now, uh, May 4th. So we've got hiking right now. In June, we'll roll out our kayak and paddleboard program. We run that through October. And then by October time frame is when we're starting to plan for our busiest season, which is our winter season, uh, where we offer skiing, snowboarding, and snowshoeing. Hmm. Wow. And then do you, um, as far as the, the types of people you work with, you said you, you kind of already touched on this, like you'll work with young people, old people, but can you talk a little bit about um, generally who is attracted to this this type of program? Is it mostly New Hampshire folks or do you get people participating from all over the region? Yeah, we serve people really from all over the country, but specifically through the New England region. Uh, a large majority and, and almost half of our uh, athlete population that comes here is actually from Massachusetts. We're one of the largest big mountains close to Boston. So we're kind of the first stop shop when it comes to adaptive ski programs uh, if you're traveling north from Boston. So we do get a lot of Massachusetts traffic. Um, but yeah, we serve anybody with any disability. We, Because we were founded by veterans, our veteran roots are still very strong. We do a lot of uh, programming with groups from the White River Junction VA, as well as VA Boston, uh, the Bedford VA. Um, and we're always hmm. looking to branch out our veteran programming. So that's that's really still a strong part of our roots and a strong part of our focus here at Nessa. But we also serve school children. We have quite a few longstanding uh, educational groups that come from different schools from throughout the New England region. Uh, specifically, we've got some up in the Upper Valley, some schools that have been coming for a long time. And those are kind of our volunteers that come, they really like those days with the school kids. Lots of smiles, lots of heartwarming moments. So that's really great. Hmm. I bet. And then with the with the skiing and snowboarding, are you limited to like one particular mountain or do you have uh, different mountains that participate that people can go to? We have branched out and gone to other mountains, but our home base, our ski lodge is at Mount Sunapee. So that is where the majority of our programming takes place in the winter. In the summer, we kind of pick locations all throughout New England. Uh, we have a 
kayak trailer where we load up as many kayaks as we oh, can into damn. that trailer and we travel all over new england and uh hmm. yeah basically try to bring our programs to people rather than them coming to us we found right. it it's it e- makes access to that particular sport a little bit easier for some folks that may not have transportation or things like that Hmm. Interesting. Wow. And with the uh, with the skiing, snowboarding, do do participants get to the point where they've kind of like I don't want to say graduated, but they they they're so self sufficient that they can just go and ski like anybody else in any mountain they want. Well, that's the goal. It's a horrible business model, but <laughs> yeah. we do like to have people <laughs> quote graduate from our program. You know, skiing, kayaking, all these sports that I'm talking about are really when you think about it, very family focused, it's something that you can do with your family. You can do with your friends. So if we get the athlete participant to a point where they don't need us anymore and their family can ski with them or they can kayak with them, then that is the goal. Uh, Of course, we love to see people coming back, but we also want to see them, you know, branch out and see other mountains. Sunapee is really awesome. I love Mount Sunapee, but there, you know, we live in the Northeast. We have a lot of great mountains around here and uh, it's good to see families get out there and, and be independent of us. That's really the goal. Yeah. yeah. And can you talk about the pipeline on, you know, how people start to get, um, get involved with adapted sports and is it sometimes a case where their medical providers or their mental health providers will kind of, you know, suggest to them like, Hey, you should get involved in this and there's some resistance there, or is it generally people that are eager to get involved? Yeah. The, so I'll talk a little bit about the veteran programming that we do. Uh, yeah. the, VA healthcare system has a great system in that they have specific programs called recreation therapy programs where uh, they'll, you know, the, the primary care physician will suggest to the veteran, hey, recreation therapy, you know, before your injury, you really loved to fish or you really loved to hike or something like that. Maybe you should get involved with the recreation therapy program and they can help, you know, facilitate some of those opportunities for you again, to get you outside again, to get you active and moving because it being outside and, and being involved in athletics or recreation with people that you're um, socializing with, it's very good for mental health. So uh, they'll suggest, Hey, why don't you get involved in this? And then our point of contact with the VA system is usually the rec therapist. So then, the rec therapist kind of facilitates, hey, we're going to go to NESA on this day, sign up if you'd like. And then that rec therapist would then give us the, all the information about the veteran, who's coming, what their diagnosis is, what kind of supports they might need, what kind of equipment they might need. Um, mm-hmm. and, they, and then we kind of all work together. So it's kind of a team effort getting these folks out and active, but it's totally worth it. I have a question just in line with that. So do you- Medical clearance was one of my questions. Um, but do you have people on staff um, such as nurses or any other um, you know, doctors or PTs or anybody like that that contribute to the uh, development of the programs? So we do, let me first answer your question about medical clearance. Mm-hmm. We do ask for medical clearance uh, of everybody that participates in our programs. Yeah. Uh, we actually only have four staff members and then everybody else that is involved with implementing our programs they're all volunteers Mm -hmm. so we have about 250 volunteers currently that number is down a little bit from covid we're still building back up Uh, the dream scenario would be three hundred three to four hundred volunteers um (laughs) But yes. those volunteers each come with their own separate skill sets. Sure. And it's not necessarily that we're recruiting doctors or nurses or, you know, physical therapists. We do tend to get volunteers that are in those fields. Um, but we also have pilots and we have, uh, you know, postal workers and pharmacists and you know, people that may not necessarily be your obvious candidate for a, a, vo- a volunteer in a program like this. So we gotcha. kind of have a wide <clears throat> array of people 
that come and help us implement these programs. We do have training, uh, quite a bit of training for our volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we do use resources like we'll bring in guest instructors from the VA healthcare system that can kind of help um, teach us about some of the medical diagnoses and how to work with them and and things like that. Gotcha. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. I'm just like wondering how you screen out contraindications and things like that. Um, yeah, obviously that's generally the the role of a, a doctor to provide you the information. But uh, you know, perhaps as we move along, you can give us like a a rough example of a classic person that might come in and what that might look like and how you guys sure. manage it. But sure, yeah. Hey, Carly, I'm curious about uh, your partnerships with equipment manufacturers and engineering. Like, do you work closely with people that will build um, custom equipment for uh, for certain uh, specific use cases? And how exactly do you uh, pay for all of that as well? Yeah, so there are a couple companies that we work with that manufacture specifically the adaptive equipment that we end up using. Um, if we need to, I mean, every athlete participant is different and comes with their own separate set of needs. So there might be instances where we might need to adjust some things, in which case we might reach out to the manufacturer and see if they have a solution. Or sometimes we just make a solution kind of in-house. It, it may not be the prettiest uh, answer. Um, the engineers can certainly, you know, do a better job than what we would do right here in-house. But uh, it, sometimes it's the solution for the day. As far as paying for the equipment, it is pretty expensive, uh, but we've been very fortunate to have some really good partnerships and some grants that are have have provided the equipment for us. Uh, and we've got some really awesome volunteers that help us maintain it as well. Interesting. That's and I great. would assume with the skiing and snowboarding, uh, the ideal scenario is they get a chance to figure out what works for them specific to the equipment you have available. And then if they really want to go long-term on their own, then they, you know, people can work to either fundraise or purchase their own equipment. That's going to be very well tailored for them. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. They, they can, we kind of have a, a try before you buy. I'll say we have quite a few different pieces of equipment that folks can come and try out here. Uh, before they make their decision on what they actually want to buy. We have plenty of people that just rent from us, you know, throughout their entire time. Maybe they're not at the level where, where they're going to be fully independent. And so they just come and use, utilize our programs and our equipment. But we do have those folks that are, you know, they they run through the ranks towards independence and that's when they want, just like you or I would want to buy our own pair of skis. They kind of shop around and see what works best for them. And uh, then there are grants available for individuals to buy their own adaptive equipment. They can fundraise or they can just pay right out of pocket for it. Hmm. Got it. And then uh, specific to hiking, what um, can you describe a little bit about um, the, the hiking program where you tend to hike and um, talk a little bit about like vol- volunteer opportunities around the hiking program? Of course I can. Yeah. So our hiking program, like I said, it's just about to gear up on Thursday, May 4th. Most of our hikes are um, right here in the Sunapee or Upper Valley area. Uh, They're not typically real long hikes. We try to cater them to the participants that are coming for that day. So it's a lot of more what I'd call forest bathing, uh, a lot of walking in the woods, not real strenuous, but enjoying nature, enjoying the scenery, and just kind of soaking it all in with friends, with whomever we might be hiking with. Um, We have done a hike up Kearsarge. That's probably the biggest one that we've done within Mm -hmm. our program thus far. Um, And we, we successfully helped two different veterans with spinal cord injuries uh, get up to the top of Kearsarge, which was no easy feat, but many hands make light work. So it was pretty cool. Well, yeah, I've done Kearsarge. Have you done Kearsarge, Mike? I have, yeah. And I always tell people that that is such a, that's one of- It's a neat one. uh, That whole region there, like I'm, those are what I call my Friday night hikes. 
you know, mm-hmm. obviously like you need a little bit more time in some cases, but I love going to Kearsarge, Monadnock and doing that. Like you can start at like two thirty, three 3 o'clock on a Friday and get yeah. up there and, um, you That's know, get really up and nice. down and it's pretty nice. But uh, yeah, those are great, great mm-hmm. hikes. Yeah, we, we really liked it. And, um, the, so the, the, we have some adaptive equipment that we use to get folks that are more medically involved up the mountain. Uh, one of the pieces of equipment that we use is called a trail rider. And essentially it's a sit down piece of equipment that our volunteers, essentially there's some pushers, there's some pullers, uh, and it can hop along rocks and on, on rocky paths. Hmm. Um, we physically help get the person up the mountain. It's, it sure. is a strenuous uh, activity, but it's great exercise. I bet. Yeah, I think I've seen those. They have like lo- there's long bars on on the front and the back that yep, can be yep. be managed. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that. Like there was one. I know that there's a, a young man that had gone up the Mount Washington Auto Road with I think a similar piece yes. of equipment. Yes, that's exactly it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, that would be f- quite a uh, an undertaking, but probably really amazing. What what did, were you on the hike to Kearsarge? Mm-hmm. What was your uh, how was it when you got up top? Um, it was actually pretty emotional for everybody bet, involved. Yeah. The this specifically specific gentleman, he like I said, he has a spinal cord injury. Um, he is able to walk short distances. Uh, so when we got to the top, you said you've been on Kearsar, so you know there's a whole bunch of rock face at the top there, mm-hmm. and with assistance, Scrambles. he was able to walk along the top of the rock face and then he then walked up the fire tower um and he flew he flew an american flag so it was really really a special moment he was very proud of himself we were very (laughs) proud of himself and ourselves uh and it was just you know it's cool to create those moments for folks um things that you know you or i might take advantage of it's just it's really cool to provide the same sort of access to to everybody to the outdoors yeah yeah it's like i take this this stuff for granted like oh yeah that's my friday night hike and like it's Mm -hmm. it's not that simple for a lot of people and uh, it's amazing that you're out there doing that um how many people do you tip would you take on on an activity like that a hike like that needs a team so so that the same people aren't pushing or pulling the trail rider up the mountain. So I think for that one, we probably had close to 10 to 15 volunteers. Uh, and we, we like to switch out. It, the goal is to have enough to be able to switch out so somebody isn't completely exhausted by the time you get to the top. Yeah, yeah. And that's not an easy, I mean, those trails are not easy either. There's a lot of rocks and I would assume a lot of lifting that goes on there. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So um, how do you go about signing up if you wanted to volunteer um, with NESA? So it's pretty simple. Uh, you could shoot us an email. Our email is info at nessa.org. That's I-N-F-O at N-E-H-S-A dot org. Or you can give us a phone call. Phone number is 603-763-9158. Um, just let us know you want to volunteer. We we recruit on a rolling basis, so it's not like we have certain windows in the year where we accept volunteers. If you want to volunteer with us, even if it was for this Thursday's hike, we would happily uh, get you on board. And uh, training also can take place on an you know as needed basis. We do have specific training days, but if you miss those days, it's not it's not the end of the world. We can still get you trained up. And there is some intake paperwork that's all on our website, but basically the easiest way is just call or email us and we can get you all the information. Okay. Yeah. And I'll include your, your contact info in the show notes. What about fundraising activities? I know you've got a big event coming up with uh, Ty Gagney and James Osborne um, this weekend, but what um, we want to talk about that a little bit and then talk a little bit about like other ways that you do. Um, handle fundraising and what listeners can do if they want to um, want to help out. Sure. So, yeah, I know you guys had Ty on your show uh, a month or two ago, and he is he and a gentleman named James Osborne are going to be doing a presentation at Colby Sawyer on Thursday, May 11th from 4 to 6 p.m. Ty wrote a book called The Last Traverse, 
And it essentially highlights the story of James Osborne, who is also going to be there. He uh, was in a pretty severe hiking uh, accident. And so the book goes all, you know, talks all about James's experience on the mountain. Um, it's a, it's a pretty intense story, but our connection, Nessa's connection to it all is that James, uh, after he lost his leg in the hiking accident, he actually ended up ski learning to ski again through our program at Nessa. So wow. there is a pretty strong connection there. James has been really awesome. He was a participant with us, but now he's a volunteer with us. So it's pretty <laughs> great to see that sort of success within our program. Uh, but anyways, at the talk, they're going to be selling books. Uh, Ty is going to be selling his book. And all the proceeds from that night are going to come back to New England Healing Sports Association. So we're really fortunate for Ty and for James and, and just even thinking of us for this sort of fundraiser. It's really great. Yeah, Great people. Definitely. Yeah, great that's people. amazing. And then it just in general, if, if people wanted to donate or if you have any other um, like seasonal fundraising activities, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, thank you. So you can donate. Uh, we have a website. There's a donate button on our website. That's probably the easiest way. But we've got several fundraisers coming up. Our next fundraiser after the May 11th event is New Hampshire Gives, which is a statewide initiative um, in the state of New Hampshire. Nonprofits are banding together to raise as much money as possible in a 24-hour event. The date for that, I think, is June 6th or 7th or 7th or 8th. I have to look at that. Um, but basically, we're you know just trying to raise as much money as possible for Nessa in a 24-hour period. That's, that's a pretty big fundraiser for us. After that, we've got a golf tournament later this summer in August. Um, and yeah, we, we do another really big fundraiser in the winter called our Ski and Ride-A-Thon, where people will try to get pledges and ski as many run, runs as possible throughout the day. That's probably our largest fundraiser. We, we usually get about $50,000 through the Ski and Ride-A-Thon event. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're always, you know, we're a nonprofit. So we're always looking at ways to raise money for the cause and to keep providing the access that we do. You know, our, our programs, skiing isn't cheap. Kayaking can't, isn't always cheap. So we like to try to be able to provide this sort of access at a reasonable rate. And we do that by fundraising for our programs. Okay. Yeah. And we'll include that in our show notes. And if you want to send us the info on the June fundraiser too, we can, we can make sure we're highlighting that. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's great. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, and then I guess the only other question I had for you that I was curious about is uh, like bigger mountains. So I know you said mostly it's just sort of like uh, woods walking and you've done a little bit on Kearsarge. Like, have you ever thought about trying to get involved with like the Mount Washington Auto Road or get involved in like other areas like Cathedral Ledge or uh, areas where you can actually road walk up to mountains? Yeah, um, we actually did participate in uh, there's a, another adaptive program up in the Franconia area. They're adaptive right. sports partners of the North Country. They do a big fundraiser called Sunrise Ascent every year, and they basically walk up the Mount Washington Auto Road in the very early hours of the morning. We mm -hmm. actually participated in that event for the first time last year, and it was really cool to see they they form it so that there's different teams of people going up, and so you kind of you know, get your team together and you all cross that finish line at the top or as far as you can get at the top. Um, so we, we were involved with that last year. We may be doing it again. We'll see. Uh, but certainly we're open to, you know, trying out new hikes like that. That's, it's always fun exploring new places. Wow. And do you get out on your own? Are you, do you consider yourself like a, a hiker in the area on your own when you get free time? It's funny you say that. I actually led our hiking training for our volunteers last week. And my first thing was, I am not an avid hiker. But well, come on, you got to get your resume built up. <laughs> this is something, you know, we started our hiking program a couple of years ago. And I'm getting there, you know, I hike you know, two or three times a week with our program. So uh, I certainly do a lot of hiking. I could branch out more, I think. <laughs> we'll get you up to Monadnock. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm there. Whew. 
I said that's the Friday night party hike. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a butt kicker. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So, Stomp, anything else? Anything I missed here? Well, Carly, you answered my question because I was curious if you partnered up with other uh, agencies such as Adaptive Partners up in Franconia. So, you answered my question. And uh, I did have a second question. Like, is there an annual massive event that you do? Like, I don't know, like Special Olympics or anything like that that you do annually that uh, requires a lot of help and assistance? Maybe yes, the volunteers uh, we do a couple, be aware of. couple di- different big events. One of our biggest is actually the New England Winter Sports Clinic for Veterans with mm-hmm. Disabilities. We partner with the VA New England Healthcare System for that event. Okay. And we usually have about 50 to 60 veterans with disabilities. They come for a week long event in January. They learn to ski. They learn to snowboard. They do a bunch of different alternate activities. Sled hockey is another activity they do. Nice. Uh, and we're actually the second largest clinic, uh, national, uh, sorry, the second largest clinic for the winter sports um, in the country. There's a national winter sports clinic for veterans with disabilities and they're huge, but we're, mm-hmm. we're the second largest. Awesome. That's great. Okay. Maybe our listeners will reach out. Yeah. So that's yeah. usually sometime in January. The dates mm-hmm. should be posted soon, actually. Great. Yeah, it'll be here soon enough. I know we're getting through the wet season right now, but um, winter will be coming again. And we'll be talking about skiing soon. But uh, but this has been great, Carly. I appreciate you coming on and uh, you're doing amazing work. Um, you know, the impact that you make on people's lives with – um, supporting them. I, I can only imagine it just, you know, when people are injured or they just are in a place where they, they don't feel like they can get exposure to activities that I think are really important to you know, address people's either mental health or physical oh, sure. wellness. Um, opening up that door again is an amazing thing and you guys should be really commended for doing that. Well, thank you guys. And again, thanks so much for having me on. This was fun and um, <laughs> you guys are a, a joy. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you can you. tell the truth that we will be better than that other podcast. That you're not gonna listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Switzerland. I'm Switzerland. Okay. All right. All right. We tried. We nice. tried. So, but thank you so much, Carly. And like I said, we'll put all the stuff on the show notes and um, maybe we could have you come back in, in the, uh, the winter season to talk more about skiing. Anytime. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah thank you. Any, I love it. Anytime you need us, just let us know. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, takeaways from that. Uh, awesome organization. They're doing such yeah. great things. Um, and I'm going to go, I want to go to Sunapee this winter and check out the, um, you know, check out the equipment and the gear and, and see if we mm. can say hi to Carly and team. Yeah. Yeah. Great crew. And they'll be on again to talk. Yeah. Um, but it's great that they're helping all these people that are unable to get out there. Otherwise, to enjoy their passions, whether it be skiing or boarding and hiking. I'm especially intrigued by the hiking. I wouldn't mind joining one of those trips. Oh yeah. A little bit. Yeah. I can imagine like, like Kearsarge is a perfect hike for that because it's like, you know, it'd be a fair amount of work to get somebody up, but it's not an endless hike, you know, so you can, you can manage. Um, so, uh, I would be interested in jumping on that too. So let me know if you, if you end up uh, following up with them. Sure. And all I could think about that whole interview was, you know, search and rescue. Whenever we have to carry somebody uphill, it is the hardest, hardest thing in the universe. And uh, I'm sure there are many out there listening that would agree, but I'm just thinking about helping these folks uphill and I'm just getting palpitations going, oh my God, PTSD. (laughs) So hats off. Great, great effort. Great, great folks. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Carly. Yeah. Slasher's hiking topic of the week. And uh, Stomp, I think you've got to go into our next segment here, but I think you have a sponsor you wanted to read, right? Yeah, Base Slate Coasters. They create unique, beautiful, functional, and expertly laser engraved coasters with topographic maps of the 4,000 footers of New Hampshire and more. 
These coasters are handmade on Cape Cod from slate quarried in the U.S. and provide a durable and heat-resistant surface for your drinks. Each coaster features intricate detailing of any mountain topography for the location of your choice. Base Lake Coasters will work with you on your custom hand-designed coasters for any street or topographic map. Let's just say anywhere on Earth or beyond. Visit baselate.com today to explore a full range of topographic map coasters. Use the code SLASHER10 at checkout for 10% off your first order. Super cool. So yeah, this um, next segment here is about the 10 essentials, which we talk about ad nauseum, but I, you know, it's like... I, we have to be cautious because there are new listeners that are jumping on and they may not be aware of this. Uh, and sometimes it's good to just do a refresher on these things. So I did some digging and, uh, here are your basics about the 10 essentials. Um, what are they for? Uh, they're basically survival items, um, that organizations, safety agencies recommend for safe travel in the back country. And they developed by pretty much the mountaineers.org organization back in the 30s. I guess there were a series of climbing courses that they uh, were conducting. And they came up with the basics of the 10 essentials. And in 1974, the list was formalized and appeared in the third edition of Mountaineering, The Freedom of the Hills. And uh, there was an update in 2017 in the ninth edition and that's pretty much what uh you're looking at for the 10 essentials today um how how were they developed essentially it's just countless volunteers their experiences and knowledge and wisdom and the basic purpose is to address two questions One, can you prevent or respond positively to an emergency should it happen on your hike or whatever And two, can you safely spend a night or more outdoors? So those are the two questions that they strove to answer by developing this list. Pretty neat. Breaks it down nice, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. So the the 10 of them, the 10 essentials are divided in two parts. So the first five are meant to uh, prevent and respond to emergencies. Okay. So that's... Navigation, maps, altimeters, compass, headlamps, uh, LED bulbs, spare batteries, sun protection, glasses, sunscreen, sun protective clothing, first aid, um, including foot care and insect repellent if you need that, and um, a knife or a multi-tool just for um, dealing with paracord and you could even bring some tape along. The second half of the list uh, is meant to just take care of yourself when you're stuck out there for one night or more. So now you're talking about fire, you know, being able to start a fire and also keep a fire going. And they suggested butane lighters, matches, flints, fire starters. Um, seven would be shelter, whether it be a tent or a bivy sack. They mentioned trash bags, like oversized trash bags, which is a cool idea, or even a tarp. Um, extra food, and this is in addition to the food that you would bring normally, or what they call the minimum expectation. So they're they're suggesting for extra food, one day's food for a short hike without need to cook. So all the all your dry stuff, whether it be you know nuts, you know fruits, whatever, cheese. Yeah, sure, cheese. Um, extra water, same thing. This is beyond your minimum water that you would bring. So. Extra water, including the ability to purify that water uh, if need be. And then 10 would be extra clothing. Yeah. Yeah. So those are your 10 essentials. And, and, uh, and I honestly never realized like that they had them broken up between like the, the five for emergencies and the, the, the five for spending, you know, time out, outdoors. Yeah. Right. Now there's a, a note here, which you may have added, I think, about insulated pads for yeah. cold weather. Hot liquid for winter, and then field sprint, splint, and wrap all year long. Yeah, yeah. So I added those. Yeah. I was like, you know, I think at minimum, like I would keep a splint and a wrap in my ten essentials. So add it as an eleven essential, and then depending on the weather conditions, like if it's cold weather, I think an insulated pad and hot liquid. Those are the other two that I would say are like essential that I would bring on yeah. every hike. But you know, well, people could argue the hot liquid, but 
Yeah, it's a good segue into the next thing because the Mountaineers.org list was the first and the most recognized, but there are multiple lists. So the answer to the question, is there a universal list? No, um, it's just a guide and it needs to be tailored to your outing. So there are multiple lists and it's really interesting when you look at the lists because they, they make sense. Like for instance, um, Boy Scouts. They include a flashlight, water, rain gear, things like that. But when you get out west into the desert terrain, they, like the the Utah's uh, Wasatch Mountain Club, they list extra water in place of extra food. So food isn't even the concern in drier, hotter terrain. Mm. Uh, It's pretty interesting. Spokane Mountaineers, they list 13 essentials. So they will include a space blanket, uh, toilet paper and trowel, and the toilet paper doubles as a uh, fire starter. That's <laughs> a smelly one, but uh, yeah. an effective one. <laughs> Depends on what you had the night before. It could maybe a quick fire starter. Yeah, that's too funny. And then there's a subcategory that I discovered. It's called the 10 Essentials Groups. So I, I guess it's an alternative method to essential gear selection. And uh, you will see this in some places like... Um, Columbia. Columbia has this uh, Apple app called Take 10 to the Greater Outdoors. And um, Central Arizona Mountain Rescue Association also promotes the 12 essentials, including signaling devices. So there are these groups out there. So it's pretty neat. I believe that Columbia app lets you pick and choose and design your own gear needs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, So that's a pretty neat idea. Yeah. So there you go. Those are your 10 essentials. Um, There are several just final points that actually are pretty interesting. And we've talked about a lot of these before, but they're just really important to go over again. So for these navigation devices, it's always super important to have a redundant backup in case one fails. So if you're relying on an electronic device for navigation, you know, make sure you have that actual hard paper copy of, you know, waterproof map in your pack, just in case your device falls uh, into the water and fries or just runs out of battery. And uh, secondarily, know how to use those devices. Um, Altimeters, or I think altimeters are really overlooked. I learned the benefit of altimeters just by bushwhacking. They, I use that personally more than anything. Um, once you know your elevation and your destination and you have a compass, just a basic handheld compass, you can do pretty much everything. So altimeters are really important in my opinion. Yeah. And I actually don't, um, I don't reference mileage when I hike that much anymore. I used to be all about like, Oh, all right, I have three more miles to go. I actually don't do that anymore. I look at like, okay, what elevation am I at and what elevation am I going to? And, yeah. you know, sometimes if you get the the pointless up and downs, it's not, not as perfect, but like I can kind of know like, okay, I'm going to take a break every 200 feet uh, of elevation that I go up. And I, I sort of look at the end point as like, okay, where do I need to be as to top out of my elevation versus I don't really pay attention to mileage anymore. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Like here's an, an example. When I do the captain, um, I'll come up to 3,000 feet on my altimeter and I'm I'm heading north to the summit cone, which I know starts at about 3,000 feet. And I just follow that contour, looking at my altimeter, making sure I'm staying at that level. And boom, you just hit your, your destination. But uh, yeah, super useful stuff. Yep. They make a comment here too. Compasses must have a base plate. I think what they're referring to, those old old school compasses, which is just circular mm-hmm. without a square or a rectangular base plate. You need that for a topographical map just to line up your arrows and get your um, uh, destination or your bearing correct. So here's an interesting point. This is latest and greatest. You would know more about this than I. My phone does not have this, but cell phones are coming with dedicated GPS devices now and compasses built in. Um, my Android does not that I'm aware of. Um, they make a point that, you know, phones are still, you know, susceptible to water and cold temps. So if you're going to be out backpacking or bushwhacking, it's still probably better to have that actual hard dedicated GPS device like a Garmin, uh, which is just, they're tougher and they're, they're better for more extreme environments. 
Um, yeah. And if you don't have like that? a dedicated guard, like I have a sort of like, I got the phone and I've got the Gaia app on the phone. Then I've got my, um, I've got my Garmin watch, which has a, a compass and altimeter and everything built into it. I don't have the map functions on my watch yet. I haven't upgraded to that, but, uh, mm-hmm. and then I got a paper map. So I've got like redundancies. I've got redundancies for my redundancies. Yeah, that's great. The next step here is the personal locator beacon. Um, Mountaineers.org was adamant that if you're doing backcountry activities off trail, you need a personal locator beacon because you can't rely on cell towers. You have to jump higher up into the uh, satellite channels for safety if you get in trouble. So they were actually really hard about that one, which is interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, First aid kits. (laughs) This is classic. You know, everybody carries a first aid kit, but nobody knows how to use them. So first of all, they can give you that false sense that, oh, I'm all set. I have a first aid kit. Secondarily, you got to know how to use the stuff inside of it, you know? So just make sure you get trained and uh, you're not just carrying this extra weight for no reason. Um, (laughs) Other useful repair kit items. I don't really have like a repair kit. I do have some things like I definitely have a multi-tool, but they suggest a repair kit. So this would include safety pins, needle and thread, uh, plastic buckles, which is a good one because I ran into a problem with that. Just trying to strap on my insulated pad this winter. I'm like, ah, damn it. So one of my buckles broke and uh, replacement parts for water filters, tent poles, uh, jet boils, things of that nature. If you're going on longer trips. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of that stuff. Like I've got like, I feel like zip ties, duct tape and um, paracord. I can pretty much MacGyver up anything I need. <laughs> there was a time I was carrying large, like eight by eight tarps and I still have them in my truck, but I haven't been doing that lately. It just reminded me talking of paracord. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Do you carry tarp? Um, sometimes, sometimes I have a tarp. I have a lightweight tarp that I use for, um, hammock camping. Mm -hmm. And I have carried that with my day pack on days where I felt like it could potentially rain because I think I haven't had to use it yet. I, but my thought is that one of the lessons I learned when I was through, I was doing like a weekend hike is some of the through hikers, like we got poured on and the through hikers, um, they just set up a tap, a tarp. Um, across some trees and just sat down and they were just like, yeah, we're just going to hang out and wait until the um, the rain ends. So mm-hmm. could do that. So, I mean, my tarp yeah. weighs nothing. It's like a thin piece of fabric that I use for hammock camping. So I could, yeah, I could they're great. take it. Yeah, they don't take, take up space. They don't weigh anything. So nope. it's really super cool. You can do a lot of things with the tarp. Um, let's see. Moving on, fire starters, cotton balls smothered in petroleum jelly and a stove for higher altitudes. Those are good, good tips. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll hear is instead of cotton balls, um, if you have a dryer in your house and you take the dryer lint, um, mm-hmm. you can save that dryer lint and just mix it up with Vaseline. And that, that also is a really good fire starter. Oh, sure. I've got plenty of that. Yep. Got some in my belly button too. Oh, like, disgusting. If I need it. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. (laughs) If I'm really in a pinch. Oh, stop. (laughs) Next topic. Oh, speaking of next topics, how about extra food ideas? Jerky, nuts, dried fruit, and MREs. Um, If a stove is on, if a stove is available. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my go-to is like, I have a lot of Snickers bars. I always have, um, Pistachio nuts with no shells are expensive, but I'll get those. And then I mix those with um, peanut peanut butter M&Ms. That's my go-to. So I'll bring a yeah. lot of those along to keep me going. Mm. And last point here, and I think they really capture this well. So when it comes to the extra clothing thing, that can be a little confusing sometimes because you can overpack uh, unnecessarily. So they tell you to ask yourself a question. And the question is, what extra clothes are needed to survive the night in my emergency shelter in the worst conditions that could be encountered on this trip? So that's the gist of the extra clothing. If you're in a situation where you you have to shelter overnight, what clothes do you need to survive that night? 
pretty simple. Yep. Yeah, it's a succinct way to look at it. So there you go. Those are your 10 essentials. And, um, you know, the hike safe thing, you know, sorry, I did not look at the hike safe list. Um, I think it's pretty similar to, if not identical to the mountaineer.org, but um, hikesafe.com is the the place that you can go to to find out about New Hampshire's hike safe program and, and their recommendations for the whites. Very good, Stomp. You'll keep everyone safe and alive out there. And um, he's, uh, you pulled a bunch of these um, links for the show notes. So we'll put these up on the show notes yeah. as well so you can take a look at them. There's like, I think he's got one, two, three, four, five, six different links around the 10 essentials from different organizations. Yeah, should keep you busy for a while. Sure will. <laughs> sure will. So, excellent. Right. So sweet beginnings, daycare is a New Hampshire state licensed child care provider that offers care for children from six weeks to 12 years with flexibility in before and after school care as well. Sweet Beginnings aims to instill a love for learning by providing a safe and positive experience within a loving and warm environment. Sweet Beginnings believes this is a good foundation to teach children in order to prepare them for their future. For more information, contact Sweet Beginnings at 603 568 Four five three zero. Visit them at Sweet Beginnings Daycare on Facebook, or email Shandy at Shandy Elliot at Outlook dot com. Very good, Stomp. So I think next we're going to do our recent search and rescue news. Yeah, yeah, we have a couple to talk about here. We do, we do. The first one is a national story, which is um, a hiker in Utah was attacked by a mountain lion. So this was a. Uh, An older gentleman, although not too old, 70 years old, fights off a mountain lion uh, with a rock. So that's pretty impressive, right? Oh, yeah. So where is this again? This was in In Utah. Utah. So um, guy was hiking around 1 p.m. on Thursday in Diamond Fork, up Spanish Fork Canyon. It's always in a canyon out there. Um, 70 year old escaped serious injury, he suffered some lacerations on his arm and head. So the guy's name is Evan Ray Nilsson and he was feeling all right following the attack, but described the encounter as a shock and a half. So a mountain lion hit me right on the <laughs> side, knocked me down the hill. I kind of hunched up or folded up and it came down around behind me and I hit it with a rock just with my hand with a rock and it took off. So he yeah. was able to get himself out of there. His his adrenaline must have been through the roof, but he got out of there and he was able to drive himself down the canyon and got treated at a hospital. That's so scary. Yeah, like, but, nice kitty. Yeah, nice kitty. Don't worry, Stomp, because Scott Root, the conservation manager with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, told news outlets that aggressive encounters between humans and mountains, mountain lions are very rare. Of course. Until so don't they worry happen. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, don't worry about it yeah, but he said several factors may have contributed a younger <laughs> lion may not be as aware of humans it could be simply that he got startled or was defending a kill but they don't really know but uh, mm-hmm. next time you get attacked by a, a mountain lion pick up a rock and whack that thing as hard as you can <laughs> <laughs> or take out some kitty treaties here you go kitty you think that would work with a bear oh I have no what a rock or I don't treaties know. <laughs> well, you know my theory. I think if you punch him in the nose, you're good to go. That's what you said. Like, I'm going to poke him in the eyes. <laughs> Bap, whap. Um, yeah. All right. And then this next one, Stomp. I didn't read this one, so I'm going to wing it, but you can add what you want because I think you pulled this one. NBC News is Morgan Chesky taken to the ICU after suffering cardiac, oh, almost suffering cardiac arrest on a hike. Mm-hmm. So um, the journalist says an undetected fever may have led to a whole lot worse if his uncles hadn't called for an ambulance. So this is good. Morgan, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so Morgan Chesky has a word of caution for the hikers. So Dallas-based Emmy-winning journalist shared an Instagram post that detailed the hike in Zion National Park, which resulted in an emergency visit to the hospital. So um, he suffered from hape. 
high yeah, altitude yeah, yeah, yeah. pulmonary it's, edema. Yeah. Which, which we've talked about a little bit. Yeah. So it looks like he yeah. was hiking with his uncles, but um, he started, I guess he started feeling a little under the weather and, you know, they had had this all planned out. They were going to be hiking in Bryce Canyon, trip to Zion the next day. Um, and I guess he had a fever on his hike to Bryce Canyon. He thought a good good night's sleep would be enough, but a few miles into the hike at Z- Zion, he got frustrated, couldn't catch his breath, and he was getting angry. His uncle grabbed his pack and, and he let him take it to finish the trail, but he was so weak that he couldn't even celebrate. He popped a Tylenol and was determined to sleep it off, but when he woke up, he was even worse. And... Um, I guess they took him to urgent care and tested his blood oxygen saturation. He was at 58, whereas normal is 95 to 100. Right. So, yeah, he had high altitude pulmonary edema. And Hmm. typically, you know, that occurs, you know, in higher elevations, I guess. But um, it can happen, I guess, is altitudes as high as 2,500 to 3,000 feet. And this guy said he's hiked at 14,000 feet before, but um, he was barely at 9,000 feet. So the doctor said, it doesn't really matter. He said, um, you know, the the body will react depending on the individual. So his lungs were filling up with fluid and it forced his heart to work harder and cause his pulse to skyrocket. So lucky dude that his uncles were able to like say, like, let's pull the plug and get you out of here. Yeah. Well, we talked about it with uh, Captain Chris uh, in regards to that whole <laughs> infamous episode up uh, Kilimanjaro yes. with Steve and all those guys. you just ascending too rapidly uh, at high elevation. And this is one of the uh, things that can possibly happen to you. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like we've joked around a little bit about like, you know, sneaking, uh, sneaking past the test, but like you do need to pay attention to that stuff. Yeah. Well... You made it out to hike another day. All right. And then we've got two in Hawaii here, Stomp. You're like the king of finding like Dude. disasters in Hawaii. Yeah. Hawaii's nuts. It's still blowing up. I can't believe how busy they are. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first one is a hiker survived a hundred foot fall over a steep ridge. The way Caroline was describing it to me, I didn't realize this, but I guess a lot of these trails are just like super wet, super muddy. And um, a lot of people have slip and falls. So this particular hiker survived a 100-foot fall over a steep ridge during a hike on Oahu in Hawaii on Sunday. Uh, The man was hiking with a group of nine other people on the Kulahu Summit Trail in Kiniahu when he stumbled over a cliff. And they'd been going about 2.5 hours before the fall. Uh, I guess a witness saw it uh, just after 9 a.m. and called 911. First responders jumped into action immediately. Like it looks like they developed a landing zone and they were able to get up there in a helicopter. Um, And by like 9.45, they were able to get to him. So like 45 minutes, like everything is just a helicopter ride there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Crazy. All trails calls it challenging. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I guess he was in serious condition, but he did survive. So hmm. that's Hawaii. And then um, another person, uh, this is actually a fatality. So visitor dies after falling nearly 40 feet while hiking Lan- Lanakai Pillbox Trail. So 68 year old visitor from Maryland was killed in Honol- near around Honolulu um, on the Lanakai Pillbox Trail. So mm-hmm. according to the Honolulu Fire Department, uh, the gentleman suffered a medical emergency while hiking and tumbled down the trail. Uh, it was his daughter's 30th birthday and they were celebrating and going to go on a hike to celebrate. Um, so unfortunately, this will be a birthday that the daughter will not uh, not remember fondly. Um, Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, you know, it does, does happen. So it sounds like he had a medical issue, tripped, fell, passed away. Right. Right. That's a shame. What are these, what's a pillbox stomp? A pillbox is from my research. It's basically, uh, an army bunker that's just left over from world war II. Um, so a pillbox, there's a couple of them on this hike and it's on Oahu and, uh, they stand out from the hill. You know, it's like if you, if you recall like uh storming Normandy, you know, with those bunkers on the beaches, that mm-hmm. type of thing. Okay. Yeah. 
Wikipedia. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find out, like, oh, okay, I see where they are. Kind of close yeah. to where um, my daughter was working out there, but that's interesting. Amazing view, though, huh? Whew. You get the water and beautiful. Yeah, it's like their version of Pompeii Cave. <laughs> yeah, true. Right. It's got all the graffiti on it. And yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, so, okay, so we got a couple of local hikes here. So, Stomp, this one was interesting. This came through last week. So, uh, April 27th, fishing game, um, we're called to Mount Kilburn in the town of Walpole. Um, 23-year-old um, hiker from Springfield, Vermont, was hiking Mount Kilburn when she experienced a medical emergency and lost consciousness. When she regained consciousness, she determined she had fallen and impaled herself on a stick, which was causing heavy bleeding. Um, the hiker was off trail at the time of the incident. So uh, luckily, they were. I'm assuming they were able to um, get a 911 call and Golden Cross Ambulance, North Walpole Fire, uh, Walpole Fire, Walpole Police and Conservation Officers responded to the call for rescue. Fire personnel were immediately immediate in their response, finding the victim and administering life-saving measures to stop the bleeding. Um, so responding personnel were able to transport the, the hiker from the mountain to an awaiting helicopter, which transported her to Dartmouth-Hitchcock. So must have been a serious, serious um, injury in order for them to activate yeah. the helicopter. Yeah, no kidding. Heavy bleeding. It's such a random thing. Yeah, I don't know where, where's Mount oh. Kilburn. I'm not really sure. I have no idea. Okay. Yep. No clue. Okay. But, we'll have to do some research on that. I mean, it feels like it's probably like Western New Hampshire somewhere, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, especially if we're not familiar with it. Uh, so this next one is a um, local story in. Maine this time. So this is in mm -hmm. Houston. So uh, headline, it may be spring, but there's still uh, snow, ice, and colder temperatures and higher elevations. And... This is a great story. Yeah. Game it's classic. Game. Yeah, it's classic, but unfortunately, I got I just got firewalled. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me take it over. So basically, uh, last Wednesday morning, uh, Colby Thayer, 26, of Farmingdale, and Larry Michael Farrington, 26, of Gardner, reported being in distress at the Horns Pond lean-to on the AT at, uh, on Bigelow Mountain. And um, they had hiked up Bigelow without snowshoes and stayed overnight. And when they awoke in the morning, their boots were frozen. They were concerned they could not make it down the mountain. Um, the game warden up there stated that the hikers were ill-prepared for the conditions in the western Maine mountains this time of the year. There's still seven feet of snow at higher elevations. So they did not have their proper clothing, such as wool socks, but had cotton socks and cotton sweatpants, which hold moisture. Um, you know, that this individual directed the men to do what they could, could to warm up and start down Horns Pond Trail to the Fire Warden's Trail to meet rescuers. Uh, they did and were met by Game Warden Garrett Moody and Eustace Fire Rescue Department member Col Connor Dolan, who had snowmobiled to within half a mile of them and snowshoed to their location. So, man, these the conditions are just crazy winter up there still. Yeah. Um, the, the hikers were given snowshoes when they met Moody and Connor and rode out on the snowmobiles to their vehicle parked on Route 27, and they did not need medical attention. So, pretty wild. Jeez. Close call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's lucky. But it's just, it is, it just hasn't gotten better up there. Like, we need, like, an extended amount. We had a couple of days, but, like, we need an extended period of, like, a week or two of, like, just nice warm weather, hitting the 70s, getting some sun. Like, I feel like it's just been overcast and kind of crappy for the last two weeks. Yeah. If uh, listeners open up the, this link, you have to go to the comments section because the first, one of the first comments, somebody says, they should be billed. And then all of a sudden it opens up the whole Pandora's box about negligence and billing and some guys yelling, oh, they already paid their taxes, so they were billed. They're like, oh, man, oh, it's boy. too funny. Here yeah. go again with the arguments, so. Um, I don't know. We've talked about that ad nauseum, so I don't think we have much <laughs> yeah. more to add. But but this was yeah. good. This was good. We learned about um, um, all kinds of stuff. History. We learned about um, the New England Healing Sports Association. Um, we learned about Stomp's belly button lint. It's great. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep, pillboxes, lint, all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go throw <laughs> up now, but we'll uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stump, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots, and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words that describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Neeland, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared. And I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all. 